<laughs> Hello, my name is Leonie Lorimer, and I'm the National Practice Leader with GHD Woodhead, and finally, the moderator for today's session. In this session, we'll explore the ideas of manifesting culture, place and identity in the Indo-Pacific. The vernacular is often complementary to sustainable architecture and design, yet in many cases these days, its manifestation tends towards the gestural. Opportunities for deeper relevance and benefit are overlooked. Similarly, sanitized and packaged versions of heritage, as well as dogmatic preservations of the past, each present their own limitations. Authentic understandings of what the vernacular has to offer the contemporary built environment can positively impact ideas of culture and how people live. This session will explore through a variety of project types in a spectrum of regional locations, the lived experience of culture, place and identity. At the end of this session and for Australian attendees, in line with achieving formal AIA refuel points, you'll be able to identify how particular cultural influences and identities inform architecture within the various countries of the region. Understand how heritage retention, integration and preservation is viewed and incorporated into projects throughout the Indo-Pacific region today by analysing the differences and what can be learned from the different models. Understand why some projects are more successful than others through culture, place and identity in specific projects and discuss how the merging of cultures and identities are influencing the architecture of tomorrow within the Indo-Pacific region, the pros and cons. Now, please note that you are required to attend the full summit program and hour of each session to redeem your four formal AIA refuel points. Today's session starts with a 40 minute discussion followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. If you'd like to ask our panel or a particular member of the panel a question, please enter it through the Q&A field at the bottom of your screen. And now let me introduce our fabulous and today extremely patient panel of speakers. Um, Akshat Bhatt is the Principal Architect at Architecture Discipline, a New Delhi-based multidisciplinary architecture practice which he founded in 2007. His work spans various typologies, from residential and retail interiors to large-scale public and commercial assignments. And spread across the length and breadth of India highlights the emergence of an architectural expression that is contemporary, yet rooted in cultural understanding of regionalism. Akshat has received many awards and accolades, and during the last 16 years, he has taught at three architecture schools in New Delhi, actively engaging with the city's academic community. Richard Francis Jones is Design Director at FJMT Studio. Richard studied architecture at the University of Sydney, receiving the Universal Me University Medal for Architecture upon graduation, and subsequently completed a master's degree in architectural design and theory at Columbia University in New York. He's a registered architect in Australia, New Zealand and the U and has led a distinguished architectural career, designing many highly awarded buildings and winning international architectural competitions. Richard has taught architecture at several universities in Australia and abroad, written theoretical papers for several journals, and has been president of the AIA New South Wales chapter. He's a life fellow of the Australian Institute of Architects and an honorary fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Michael Mosman is a Kuku Yalanji man, born and raised in Cairns, Cairns on Yidinji country. He now lives and works on Gadigal land. Michael is a lecturer and researcher at the University of Sydney School of Architecture, Design and Planning, where he has just been awarded his Doctor of Philosophy with the topic of his thesis, Third Space Architecture and Indigeneity. 
He's also a registered architect who champions country and the First Nations cultures as agents for structural change in the broader architectural profession at educational practice and policy levels. And last, but certainly not least, is Goy Zenru, who is a director of Goy Architects and has studied and worked in both Singapore and Switzerland, where her experiences influenced her approach to architecture and was the catalyst for a research trip in Thailand for her master's thesis on the topic of regionalism. In 2015, Zinru set up her practice, Goy Architects, that spans three Southeast Asia countries, Singapore, Indonesia and Thailand. And together with her colleagues, she seeks to push the boundaries of vernacular and regional crafts while embracing technology and modern working methods, producing award-winning projects such as the 2020 Indie Awards Best of the Best Project, Sukhasantai Farms Day. So that's our introductions and let's, after this delay, get straight into the questions. So. The first question is, how do we identify particular cultural influences and identities that inform architecture within the various countries of the region? What are these influences and how do they differ? So Akshat, I'd like to start with you. Your architecture practice reaches into both high tech and adaptive reuse. In what way does your Indian culture influence your thinking? Um, well, in, in our case, I think, um, well, what we, what we studied with high tech, what we understood with high tech architecture was just optimization and efficiency and, uh, sort of understanding lifespan, how to make things, uh, how to make things modular, how to sort of detail spaces and how to plan and detail elements and spaces in a manner where they can, uh, where they can actually be sort of re replaced and reduced in, in a sense. Um, whereas I think what what we what we what we look deeply into for you know for Indian uh, influence and, and and context is uh, you know is our understanding of or is how we use space. How I think in, in India most things are fairly democratic uh, or spatial use is democratic. There is a wide influence and a wide variety of, uh, of a, a multitude of people who actually use uh, any particular any space. Because we have insane uh, socio-economic diversity, um, and that studying that you know how uh, a studying people and then uh, understanding the you know simplistic materials is what uh, I think informs our architecture. Okay. Michael, you're an Indigenous Australian architect. Um, how do your ideas and practice bridge different cultural worlds? I think the main um, idea is how you connect to your place and what that means in a deep, you know, a deeper understanding of what that means. And for me, it's about connecting with country or country as, you know, we are part of it uh, or we are country. And that's something that uh, informs the ways that I practice. And it's something that I uh, promote to my students um, in studio spaces, in, you know, how you communicate ethical practices, for instance, of getting down to some really fundamental foundational concepts of where you are. So for the Australian context, it's always about this place has been you know, inhabited since time immemorial. And that's a really fundamental concept that we can come back to. And that informs my ways. And I think it's really important that we bring people into this conversation and to embrace that and to find ways for themselves as well to connect with that notion. So we are, you know, connected to a place 
we're also connect I'm also connected to places overseas as well through heritage South Sea Island uh, you know, English and Irish and heavily you know immersed in the colonial systems that we have all around us today but there's a, something that a, that there's a deeper level of engagement that we can practice or take on uh, in the way that we carry out our design processes and the main thing yeah that idea of connecting with country is a very fundamental starting point mm. So um, we might shift gear from the most ancient culture to the newest on our panel today. And um, I'll ask Zinru, what does it mean to be Singaporean as an architect and designer? Well, I think that's a, a quite a big question. Um, to be honest, I'm still actually finding out myself. Um, what does it mean to be a Singaporean in this region in that sense? But what I could kind of share with the panel is that um, our team is quite unique in the sense that we are working regionally together, together with uh, Indonesia, with Thailand and Singapore. And I find that when there is such um, interesting cross uh, conversations between the nations, then we start to kind of understand what we are actually good at in that sense. Like what is Singaporeans good at? What is, what is the advantages that Thailand have? What's the advantages that Indonesian have? And to this kind of cross-cultural kind of conversations, then we could kind of leverage on whatever that... Um, each of us have benefits in, for example, in Singapore, it's just lack of any natural resources. And what we are good at is really at systems. Like we can set up a system. We could like kind of like get everybody to work <laughs> together to kind of like create something together. And in Indo, you have all this uh, amazing textures and craftsmen that is available in Thailand. Everybody's so good at design, you know. So I think that um, by working together, we kind of, uh, shape this new regional identity in a sense and uh, i i mean i'm still finding out actually so i, I, I i'm trying to answer you but uh, we are still trying to discover day by day through the studio practice yeah yeah cool so richard you must have guessed i'm coming to you next <laughs> so um in your view what is the relationship between a project and its place and its cultural context uh, I think that interconnection is fundamental and this this question of um, culture and identity is a really tricky one, Leonie. I think um, I was quite pleased you didn't say, well, as an Australian architect or as a... Just because, of course, <laughs> what we immediately do when we talk like that is we categorise yeah. identity right? and we limit our connections to each other and to place. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, listening to Michael, listening to Andrew, you couldn't... You couldn't think of two more polar connections to culture and identity. I think so, uh, and um, you know, I, you know, I wasn't born in this country that I now consider myself a part of, and you know, when I'm listening to Michael, I feel like I've only just arrived here, and I feel, um, you know, a certain disconnection from where I am relatively. And having worked also in New Zealand for many many years, you know, it was in a way a, a very profound confrontation with First Nations culture and people. And I think the incredible challenge that we face as a, as a you know, Western um, kind of uh, uh, colonial settlement of these lands. Um, but also, of course, we are a, a, a global community, you know, and we are, we are facing global challenges and there is a global emerging culture. So um, I think these things are very difficult to balance. And, and when we think about culture and identity, I, I do think deeply about place, about land, about our human connection with it, about how the ceremonies that have taken place over, over time, the connections we've developed through human activities, be they positive ones or be they negative ones, be they celebrations or be mm. they actually seen of violence. You know, the one thing is the mark the land makes on us, but we make marks on the land and it's never the same again, you know. And uh, so this is um, a wonderful conversation to participate in because it is so difficult, it's so challenging. And I think the only way we will really make progress is to understand that None of this is easy for all of us. We're all damaged by what has happened, whether we're the perpetrators of it or the victims. And somehow it's finding a sense of identity that is inclusive, that is forward-looking, and that also is 
backward looking. Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to our second question now about how do we understand how heritage retention, integration and preservation is viewed and incorporated into projects throughout the Indo-Pacific region today? Is it by analysing the differences? And if so, what can be learned from the different models? So um, I'm going to start with Zenru um, because you've done a wonderful project for a fabulous client in the Hing House and um, I love it so much. Um, can I ask you uh, about, um, you know, uh, sort of how you resolve contemporary architecture and, and heritage? Yeah, I, I think that um, a lot of times when we look at houses, we are really uh, addressing issues of very fundamental stuff. Um, of course, we are talking about having a um, physiological kind of comfort, it's a shelter and stuff like that. But I think more importantly, if we look at the Maslow chart of uh, 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 hierarchy chart of Maslow, you are looking at the higher level, which is a sense of belonging. Then you are also talking about esteem needs as well as self-actualization. So the way that we try to do this um, house is that we are trying to also kind of bring back a little bit of memories for the families. Uh, try to relate them back to what kind of lifestyle they have actually lived in the past before because the father used to stay in a kampong setting, it's like a village settings. Um, they have very open kitchen settings whereby people could just come in, the neighbours could come in and there is like close by farms that, is, uh, that they can pick their produce from. So we are trying to emulate that, especially in this very dense Singapore uh, kind of urban setting. So how do you do that? So the way that we did it is that we try to bring the kitchen to the front, we try to give open kitchen, uh, open gardens at the, the driveway so that the father could actually pick his produce and cook uh, dinners or lunch. And then we also have this um, use of textures, which we, in this case, we actually use recycled uh, louvered windows. So louvered windows is also a, a kind of architectural uh, element that is very present in Singapore's old shop houses. And by using just that kind of a texture into the house, it kind of also kind of triggers a little bit of memories for the family uh, to say that, oh, you know, they are living in this very nice, well, natural ventilated space that doesn't really need so much uh, air conditioning spaces. So I think it's, it's true also organization of space so that you can actually introduce like a spatial, like a new ritual for the family to remind them of like some of the memories that they have in, in the old village times. And second is actually the use of textures that we try to remind them that, oh, you know, these are some of the palettes that has been available in the, in, in, in the design kind of uh, environment in the past, for example. Fantastic, yeah. thank you. So, um, Ashkart, you've um, done um, a wide range of heritage work despite the fact that you're a very high-tech kind of a guy um could could you just um talk about how you respond to heritage well we're really living in a century of uh, recuperation so to speak right there aren't there isn't so much there aren't too many natural resources left for us to consume so um well this our idea with working with, and, and, and we actually do feel that there is enough from the past that we can preserve. So the idea with, of, uh, of us engaging with, uh, uh, with, uh, with historic buildings and is actually, is not just preserving the past and not just sort of returning to tradition, but, um, you know, adding a layer on it, which is, uh, you know, that, that, that allows us to create new memories from it, right? And, that could be through, you know, through shared civic responsibility or create, creating spaces that encourage civic responsibility through, you know, some sense of radical inclusion, um, uh, you know, resource optimization and whatnot. But I think most of this sort of hinges are, uh, you know, sort of uh, moves around a sort of social agenda of, you know, inclusion and sort of a dignity of social interaction. Um, and that, you know, in, in the kind of work that we do with it, it sort of spans, uh, spaces for younger sort of upcoming, you know, uh, uh startups and, and, and moving all the way through to, you know, five star hotels and maybe even some city centers. So we've, uh, most recently we actually engaged with a, you know, a, a six kilometer stretch of, of an old city where we just, I, 
as an as an herbal intervention. And all we did was identify a few critical nodes um, and clean up and start cleaning up the city. But what we did find was a an old step well, an old reservoir that was a self uh, regenerating aquifer that was used as a dumping ground. And it took very little from us financially and 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 technically to sort of clean it up. And it suddenly became a democratic space. It became a democratic space uh, that that is a a safe space for engagement um, for 20 odd hours in the day. Fantastic. Um, now, Richard, I know that you've got um, a, a very uh, strong view on um, heritage, so I'll just invite you to share that with us. Um, look, I would say, Leonid, that, you know, built heritage, built manifestation of our heritage is, is really important to us. Um, and the number of challenges we face with that right now, I mean, these, these buildings do embody the kind of values and aspirations of the moment they were built. Um, but also many of these buildings go a little bit further than those temporal things to something much more fundamental. Um, and for us, I think particularly now in this kind of, you know, modern, slightly kind of disconnected existence that we all live, mm. that connection to our past is really important. We have a, you know, a love of old buildings that connect us uh, within our lives, which are very disconnected. Um, so I love them, you know, and as an architect, you know, it's a wonderful thing to work with around next to heritage buildings, to study them, to understand how they came into being, how they composed. But one of the problems we face, and it's really a result of our, our kind of modernist heritage on top of this, is that we tend to think about our heritage buildings as static, you know, as kind of relics, as museum pieces, whereas architecture isn't like that. It's something that lives, it's never static, it's constantly changing. And if we look at some of these buildings, including many in the city I live, you know, in Sydney, they're actually built by several architects over longer periods of time. If we've got Rome, you know, it's very fine to find, hard to find one building built by one architect in Rome. And yet when we come to our heritage buildings now, there's a sense of fear that we're going to make them less through our work with them, when in fact, we should see that we can make them more by doing that. So I think we need to understand our heritage and our architectural heritage better. And we also need to be more confident and bolder with how we adjust it to reflect our current values, our current aspirations and our current needs. Thank you very much. Now, Michael, um, what, what does heritage um, mean from your perspective? What I does think it mean the, to you? The part of the question of the, the question about difference is really important. So you know, I was introduced as an Indigenous architect. Uh, which, you know, the reality is, is that I'm, I'm trained in architecture and I have a particular way and that way is always evolving. And you know, there's all these different exchanges and interactions that take place as for everyone and everything, you know. So it's really important that, and building on what Richard was saying before about ident that the notion of identity and the staticness of that, in that, you know, things are never static. Things are always moving, always interacting. And there's always spaces between these interactions that then formulate these new ways that, you know, you wouldn't have gotten out of if you, were, you know, was, wasn't interacting in the first place. You can't help but interact. It's just part of what happens. And that's the sort of domain that I sort of take it, take it within. Like when I'm first interacting with students in a studio space, it's about tell us about all the cultural differences that exist in this space at this moment. What can you tell me about yourself? How can we find commonalities through, you know, those explorations of difference? And that way you can build these relationships and you can then extend you know, new concepts based on those relationships. Same thing with buildings, you know, the, our, our heritage, it's extensive, you know, it's extensive back to the early 1800s here in Sydney. Those buildings, they're built from country. You know, the sandstone is quarried nearby. The timber, it comes from a place where people occupied and connected with, you know, those trees or those forests. So there's a history there that carries through to the moment those places are built. 
and you never know you know the connection that aboriginal people or you know with their ways they may have connected and formed memories with these heritage buildings and then that exists into the present day and you start to form these new connections so it's always about an interaction there and mm. we can i can put that notion towards you know forward to my students um and within the faculty itself within the school itself and just you know put it out there about you know this is about establishing relationships heritage is here it's part of our history you know there's also a deep time connection to a, a heritage that has so much difference across this whole continent mm. so mm -hmm. we can you know engage with that and we can really reciprocate what that means through the expression that comes out of the architecture that we practice that's great so the next question uh, why are some projects more successful than others as they relate to culture place and identity can you specify particular projects and what makes a successful project so michael while you you have the floor um what makes it a, a successful project as it relates to culture place and identity for you well i think it's that connection to place is a really fundamental architectural principle um and by that you then start to get connections with with people and with all beings for instance so a great place that's happened in the pandemic <laughs> the COVID lockdown here in sydney um, for the last few weeks uh, is, uh, is my local park that's sydney park and it has a deep history you know connection it's on gadigal land it mm -hmm. then became a brick work um, it, you know they, they uh, manufactured bricks dug deep pits um, so the the bricks that form, um, form up built infrastructure in the area that's come from the ground and that's the case for most of our colonial setups then it became a, a rubbish tip so it's filled with rubbish and now it's been reclaimed and it's a beautiful park and they re-established it with infrastructure landscape um, in, you know artwork installations that people can connect with and it's not just about people it's about everything can connect with it the native endemic species in the landscape that brings in birds and bees and you know there's water feature there's water um, retention um, features that um, encourage bird life to come in there's that we've in the last five weeks we've seen visited the park every week and seen black swans with cygnets wow. and we've seen them develop into these beautiful growing um, you know they'll soon be grown up so we've seen just by connecting in that in that way mm. that this space with this infrastructure and how it's then um, how this infrastructure has been implemented there's this grander vision that somehow you know someone has really thought through and people are you know everything is connecting with it in this built-up space so i think it's a fabulous intervention beautiful idea and it mm. just takes you back to that very fundamental concept of connecting with place mm. Mm. so um akshat um you undertook a highly successful project in rajasthan the uh, manu ranakpur hotel um why do you think that was a success um i think architecture stands uh, you know with one leg in a few thousand hundred years bc and i mean a few thousand maybe centuries uh, and 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 another leg in the 21st century and uh, i think the ranakpur project was often seen as a sort of critical regional dialogue um but it wasn't really that i, th I think the success of the appreciation of of uh, the Ranakpur project was the contribution to place. It eventually uh, demonstrated an architecture that was open to a multiplicity of uh, influences and values. Um, so, if you want, uh, and, and there is there is no set formula for it, but but beyond material affectation, beyond architectonics, and us thinking of, of ourselves as sort of puppeteers to control space and region and time. I think um, I think the real success of a project is, uh, you know, well, contribution to place, and and you know, embracing 
you know the 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 social context and the people around it and most importantly a process that actually relates to the work and not a process that's esoteric um, and there are multiple layers to it which, which may begin with how what you construct with how you construct or how you how you go about the building process which isn't, isn't just about the physical manifestation it's also about how you embrace the you know the smaller societies that are that that's around the, the space where you're doing let's not forget that every large project is also a fairly uh, is, is a significant social, uh, economic contributor to mm. uh, to a space mm. Mm. Okay, um, uh, Richard, um, you talk about successful projects being ones that have a greater obligation to explore questions of cultural significance. Um, perhaps you could expand on on some of those ideas. Sure, Leonie. I think, look, look, one, of course, every project can say something about its place and its moment in time and its culture. But some projects do bring with them a greater expectation or obligation. Um, if we think, for example, well, we could think, for example, of projects which exist on a very sensitive site in terms either its natural habitat or its history. Um, sometimes bad things have happened and they need to be remembered and therefore doing any work in that place carries a special obligation with it. But also the purpose of the building, the function of the building is a key factor here. So if we think of the art museum, for example, or a museum, generally, these, these are in a way, buildings which are going to accommodate cultural artifacts, mana and memories, and they are, we are going to go to these institutions to actually understand who we are at a deeper level through the artworks and through the artifacts. So they come to hold a greater significance and opportunity in terms of our cultural identity. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to do that successfully. You know, we've, uh, we've seen, for example, an incredible production of globalized art museums which have been um, in a way placed into different places around the world by highly talented kind of um, you know global brand architects in a way to say that this city has made it this city is now international and therefore here is this incredible sculptural work um, which brings it into the 20th century as a as a piece of technology and as an artwork in itself um, or one can take the approach of actually looking deeper into this place, this place where this building is connected to and where it is going to become a storehouse for the memories, the culture, and I think the, the kind of collective identity of, the, of those people. And, and that brings with it this great opportunity, but also this... Uh, a greater obligation. And we could, we've seen these two things happening around, around the world. In fact, mm. Mainly, we've seen the first be highly successful in branding global cities, including ones here in Australia, for example. Thank you. Um, and Sinru, uh, Farmstay Sukhsantai yeah. uh, was the Indie Awards 2020 Best of the Best. Why was it oh. so successful? <laughs> I, I, I think that I, I would like to also add on to what Michael has said. This connection to the environment is very strong and it's very important for the projects as well. And I thought about it as well. There is, I think, three components if I want to distill it. First is actually creating this like shared experience within the space itself. So when people come to the space, they go through certain rituals and then they have a common experience and this creates memories. And it's important for us to kind of evoke memories from the past as well as create new memories for the future because this is the memories that we're going to move into the future with these are the things that we're going to learn from you know like have some shared experience for that and i think the third most important part is really the ability for the space to inspire people to do more so the farm stay is generally just a farm stay it's just people to come in and then they stay but i think the amazing part of the project that i really i mean I, we didn't plan that it would be so successful but the, the whole idea was that when people come they feel so inspired by the kind of environment that they have and and they start to learn more about how the farmers are growing the organic uh, vegetables they start to learn how to be more careful with the food that they eat you know not to waste so much you know so actually small little steps like this could create I think new memories, new rituals for the people, and then this would then create a new culture or like influence in the identity of 
uh, the place in this itself. So then I think these are very important aspects of it rather than just uh, looking backwards, but we have to see how new opportunities for us to kind of create new memories looking forward. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, our last formal question is, how is the merging of cultures and identities influencing the architecture of tomorrow within the Indo-Pacific region? And um, I think I'll ask this question uh, primarily to Zenru because you have a, a unique style of practice where you um, your three leaders are all uh, crossing national borders. Um, so perhaps you could talk about how uh, that uniqueness influences and enhances your practice. Yeah, um, I think as mentioned in uh, the earlier part of the, the conversation, uh, all of us, we are very inspired by whatever the regions bring to us. You know, it's like we, we have like big open eyes when we are going into different factories or industry and then we start to look at how people weave uh, different kind of rattan or like the use of timbers, you know, and we find that there's so much exploratory uh, possibilities in Southeast Asia that has not been explored yet. So the, the studio, how it does is that we, we try to have three different teams in three different areas and we would send out like uh, small little probes, like we'll go into different factories and we'll see what's available and then we'll bring back and then we'll discuss to see how can we use them in our projects. So then how can we make them to be a bit more modern? How can we in, uh, kind of maybe improve the design or use traditional uh, technologies and stuff like that. And I think that when we mix this kind of textures from the past as well as a modern setting, it really gives and generates a, a very nice conversation. It, it, it brings back memories to people about how things used to be made. And then also like it, it kind of like, uh, like the, the materials actually uh, allows us to connect back to the makers, which is, I think this is something very, very intrinsic for us, the desire to kind of connect back to the maker, how things is produced. And it's almost as a antithesis to all the industrialized products that we are touching and feeling now. So the, the studio is very into like very tactile kind of material, you know, and to see what's the kind of different defects that is there because all the small little variations are, is what makes um, the objects beautiful. And we really appreciate that small little details of it, yeah. Yeah, I might segue with that idea across to something that Richard said to me when we were having a chat. And uh, it was about that, that we live in a, a time when we're dominated by image consumption and that, that you know, we're sort of consuming images of, of built environment and we're also curating images of ourselves. And so to ask you really, how can we develop a strong sense of identity both culturally and personally in this sort of the context of this image consuming modern world? I think there's a real risk for us there, Lonely. I think um, it's, it's a very difficult territory that we have to navigate because the world that we live in, which is so visually dominated, it's so kind of fabricated in a way, it's so digital, it is so focused around simple consumable images and also the commercialization and reduction and commodification of what we do and culture in general. So when we, you know, when we have this desire to connect more deeply to a place, to a culture, to a culture that we may only be on the periphery of, um, then there's a risk. Once this becomes a kind of, um, if you like, uh, not so much valued, but priceable entity, something that can be consumed and reduced to a commodity, then there's a real risk. There's a real risk that we're actually going to do the opposite of what we seek to do, that we will take um, a connection to country in this land, um, to First Nations um, uh, cultures in places like New Zealand, uh, to our own um, more marginalised groups within more modern societies, and we will reduce them in this desire we have to kind of connect. And we, we've all seen that, you know, we've seen that in the architecture, we've seen it in the artworks. So in a way, you know, we need a little bit of hesitancy. We need a little bit of care and time and above all, probably respect when we do this because we will put at risk our very heart's desire if in, in that process we reduce it to something less and that actually is the natural course of kind of the commodification of culture in a globalized state. 
it's hard. It's going to be hard. Mm. So um, I'm just going to fuse some of the questions I had on um, together with uh, questions that are being asked in the chat line. And um, I'm going to turn to Michael here because you've been raised in two worlds or more than two worlds. And, um, you know, sometimes they're uh, uh, very different views of culture and identity. And sometimes they can even be potentially divisive. So can you offer advice as to how we um, begin the process of integrating cultural uh, culture and identity into a project that, that steers a course through those um, different worlds and um, you know we 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 have a, a richer project mm. as a result yeah yeah i think it's uh, you know talking about it earlier just with the relationships that you develop um and the reciprocity that comes with that and you know sometimes you just have to be quiet and listen and learn and educate yourself and understand what that means. And, you know, the, the building, of, uh, what Richard was saying just earlier, the, the, symbol, the, 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 the symbols and signs that are around us, you know, it's just enveloping us. It's just you know, overload of this. Uh, and, to, and to take things back to a really a fundamental space um, to remove ourselves from these, um, you know, it, it, this sort of artificial realm that we live within, uh, we, we can, you know, really deeply understand what, you know, cultural values connect and how they do that. So, yeah, I just think it's, you know, we can sort of peel back the layers and broaden our cap capacity to build networks and reach out and find different ways that you haven't come across before and learn from that and apply that to to your practice i think it's such a you know, fundamental human quality you know to sit around a fire and just be present be comfortable in each other's presence, create these safe spaces, connect and you know, build new narratives basically. And you know as 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 an architect, it's it's so easy to get caught up in our in our advanced capitalist world. But that's the situation and we have to evolve with that. But we can always, you know, maneuver and sort of you know piece together these different ways and and make those attachments to to um <laughs> to sort of shift you know those sort of qualities of these systems that are outside of our control in most cases so it goes beyond the architecture it's the sort of whole cultural and political domain that we exist within you know that that justifies things like colonialism and um the the sort of oppression of indigenous peoples we can learn from what we have through our first nations cultures and all the differences and all the diff all the ways all the pedagogies all the different practices that have occurred and have evolved into contemporary you know the current times and no doubt that these things are conversations that i pass on to my children to to, to continue on with mm. so i'm optimistic you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> that there's a lot of, op there, there are open minds out there um, mm -hmm. and we can shift systems, but you know, the systems are here and we are, you know, I'm embedded in it. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it still doesn't rule out that there's ways that you can make yeah. those shifts. So Akshat, when we were having our conversation, um, I was fascinated um, that on the one hand, you're a progressive metal guitar player, you know, leaping around the, the stage doing acrobatics, etc. And on the other hand, you were talking about um, the, um, the 
time of, of the Indian culture about um, how everything in the Indian culture is so deeply thought out and that uh, you were talking really about the, the fundamental difference between the sort of, you know, you've suffered a colonial um, past as well, but this sort of this deep Indianness, and um, you said that sometimes you've actually got to take yourself outside that to be an an outsider to um, reinterpret or to to bridge these cultures that you live in. I might just ask you to, you know, uh, talk about all the worlds that that you inhabit and how that influences the way you approach approach a project. Um, so I think what happens, uh, well, it's it's a personal journey, I guess, and um, for obvious reasons, when you are in your teens, you start playing guitar and you and you and you gravitate towards rock and metal. Um, but with me, what happened was that I wasn't just I I sort of started veering towards the more technical, virtuosic side of playing. Right, so I was listening to players like Steve Vai and, uh, and, and, and Joe Satriani and, you know, and uh, Maustin and such. So, and, you know, and, and that, and the quest to sort of find your own voice in, in the world of music in my early teens, sort of you know, gave me a clue to, or, or some, something that pushed me towards looking at, at uh, fusion and, and Indian classical music and, and trying to study the fundamental differences between what is uh, classical music in India was classic or in, in our part of the world in classical music in the West and similarly popular music in the West and popular music here. And there are two very, and, and it sort of led me to study the fundamental differences between, uh, you know, the philosophies of the West and the East. Um, I didn't find that quest or, or I didn't find that dialogue in architecture school. Uh, when I joined architecture school, um, and really I joined architecture school because I wanted stationary, not because I wanted to be an architect. Um, and the, you know, the, the sort of need to find engagement and excitement, uh, you know, as, as a young person, was uh, well. The only way I found out of it was to, uh, or one of my one of the tricks I thought I could use was the tricks that I'd learned in music. And that got me engaged with, uh, with with progressive architecture, or with or with British high tech. The, really, the first building I saw that I that was a that I'd never seen before. The kind of which I'd never seen before was, you know, this this rooftop extension by Cook um, and then led me to the Sancho Pompidou, and then trying to understand contrast and composition, and then you know, studying Piano's work, I saw the Tijibao Cultural Center. Which said, well, there can be more to it. So it's not just, again, you're not just sort of. It's you know, I would say it's analogous to sort of flying around on stage as as the Sancho Pompidou, loosely speaking, and then finding more meaning in it. Um, I I think um, you know you, you a lot of what we see is about dissonance. You know, so that's the error that we often talk about when we start looking at patterns and materials and techniques, etc. And we say the error becomes the detail, but uh, then I think if you start looking beyond the dissonance, you start looking at what people generally see as, you know, exquisite dissonance is um, is, is is a lot about juxtaposition, you know, in architecture. Really. And um, if you can find ways to address time space, you would have some degree of success. If we if we find ways to then embrace people, you would find a lot of success. Okay. And I, I'm sorry. One last thing, I, I, as the as a point that it's not just about you know the familiarity of the past, but it's often about at least in my world offering an op a promise for an optimistic future. You know, in in this part of the world. Mm. Thank you. And. Last but not least, of course, Sinru again, um, uh, you uh, travelled and you studied and you studied in different parts of the world and then that gave you a 
perspective back on being Singaporean. Could you just perhaps um, take us a little bit on that journey and um, how it's led to your views today? Hmm. I think the, the story that I'd like to share is that when I went to Switzerland, um, then I think they always have this small little cafe pauser one at 11 o'clock, one at 4.30, and we'll be sitting around and we'll be really discussing like all different cultures. So they'll be very interested, like, hey, so how do you do architecture over in Singapore? You know, like, how do you, what do you do? You know, stuff like that. So it, it really got me thinking and kind of reflecting a lot about the architecture that we are producing in Singapore as well. And, and of course, everybody's very influenced by the modernist movement and everything is kind of international style. And it really got me thinking a little bit like, how are we different in any sense more than the rest? Like, how, how, how can we approach architecture differently with a, as we have different kind of different set of environmental uh, considerations as well? How can we create new form of architecture or even look at the vernacular kind of architecture and bring it to the international stage. So I think this was something that was like kind of embedded in me subconsciously, like where is our voice? What do we, what do we, how do we represent ourselves to a certain extent? And then maybe towards, towards the, the further part of my career, then I start to subconsciously be very drawn to regional kind of vernacular languages and materials. And I, I think then the, the studio started to slowly kind of see how can we actually uh, use some of this vernacular knowledge in our modern architecture. And there's a lot of like benefits as well as um, um, uh, useful strategies that's used during the vernacular architecture uh, kind of uh, um, examples that we could use and adapt in um, our modern architecture. So I think that's that's uh, that's what I want to say. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Now I might need some stage directing from Jan because we started I think ten minutes late, and uh, we've gone I think five minutes over now so um that's okay Leonie. Just another five going. minutes yes just most definitely fantastic Go so we'll, we'll take the last five minutes to just have closing thoughts from each of our panelists so um i'm just looking alphabetical order we'll go with akshat first um just a closing thoughts <laughs> remark um well, I think, I mean, I'm fundamentally stuck with two dialogues right now. One is that it's essentially a recuperation. So look at what you have. Um, and architecture is not really about the last perfect building or the new clever idea, but it's about, uh, it's about offering, uh, it, it's about offering a platform that can create new history and, uh, and possibly new memories for its inhabitants. Okay, um, that, um, I'm going to take um, Zinru as a Z, not a G. So we'll go <laughs> to Michael next. <laughs> Just for a closing remark. Oh yeah, I think it's all about process um, for me. It's it's such a fundamental architectural thing. And in life too, yeah. It's um, what you, how you go about doing the the practice that you do. Um, from from my perspective, you know, it's getting, it's it's about recognizing, acknowledging, and celebrating country, and and traditional knowledge holders who have, you know, who who are, who are country. So that it, there's a really fundamental um, starting point you know, that we can, as architects advocate for and you know really put out there for you know our allied disciplines to and our and our political domains to um you know follow in this sort of uh in this sort of way um i would i must mention as, as well to actually that i i actually um loved steve by uh, <laughs> <laughs> so and that's the other thing it's like you know you can have these sorts of conversations and connect in some way so that's uh, you know over 30 years ago um and that takes me back to uh, back in time to very important memories of who i who i am um and that's what we can share you know give to each other uh is making those connections and uh, understanding what those things mean and how they they can 
positively impact on on, okay. on in a future proofing um you know your your design ways great and richard um thanks Sorry. i would say look in connection to place and uh, culture um you know key thing is listening you know key thing is listening i think starting not with arrogance but actually trying to do no more damage is a good place to start mm -hmm. um and i also think who you work with authentic voices you know connecting with people directly through the work and also time you know and i have to say these are things which are very difficult to find in the <laughs> beginning of the 21st century and i i just like to end by, by i just remembered a story when we were talking about uh, uh, one of my former collaborators, Romaldo Gergola, you know, Italian American architect, uh, designed the Parliament House here, became an Australian citizen. And a conversation I had with him at one point was um, that you know he didn't really feel Australian. He didn't really feel connected to this place until he buried the body of his wife here. Um, and I think there's some, that sort of tells us something about the depth and significance of our connection with land and how ultimately personal that is. Mm. Mm. And um, Sinru, you've yeah. got our final close. <laughs> <laughs> Always last. <laughs> I, I think that um, at the end of the day, uh, spaces really shapes our activities and it shapes our rituals, it shapes our memories and in turn it shapes our identity. So I think we really need this identity to reflect on our past, to have really a foothold of our present so that we can plan and chart for the future. So for, for me or like designers, like I think design is like a reflective tool. Uh, it, it's something that evokes emotions, uh, awareness to discuss about our culture of what we have. And we are not just looking like a homogeneous bag of things. It's, it's really about a big mix. And this is when the excitement comes in for the future, right? And through this reflection, we really hope that we could be better, better version of ourselves uh, in an attempt to be really uh, enhancing like the humanity as a whole, I would say. So understand the past to inform the stories of the future. Yeah. Yes. So um, we're now at the end of our session. I'd like to thank you all, uh, Akshat, Richard, Michael and Zinru. It's been um, great. I've loved it. I've had fun, I've learned a lot. Um, the next session is going to be at 1.45, uh, running for an hour, and it's the Housing Balance, Design, Community and Economy in the Indo-Pacific. So I would encourage you all to take a short break and come back and um, enjoy the next session. And judging by the flurry of sort of thumbs ups, claps, hearts, ice creams, celebrations. <laughs> um, I think that uh, you've all nailed it. So thank you everybody for your attention and thank you for your contribution panelists. Thank you, Leonie. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone.